Welcome to the Roto-Wire Fantasy Football Live show again. Five days a week we go at this at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Of course, if you missed the show, you can always catch the replay on Roto-Wire YouTube. I'll post those up on my Twitter page, at Jim Coventry NFL. During the preseason, remember, we take Thursdays and Fridays off, so those will be the two days we're down, and every other day we'll be back at you with some Fantasy football analysis. Now, if you've been liking the show, please consider hitting that like and subscribe button if you're on Rotoway or YouTube, and it'll help the bosses know that you like and value the show and help me out a lot. Thank you. And if you would consider following me on Twitter or socials at Jim Coventry NFL, I did not get a player um, thread posted yesterday, Monday, but I will double up and I'll get caught up. I'll get two of them today coming back from the expo weekend. A bit of a whirlwind, a lot of work to do, but I am getting caught up fast. And finally, stay tuned to the end of the show. I'll have Anthony Servino of Rotowire Gambling.com and the FF Face Off Island to talk about some training camp news. And that's where I'll start. Now, the two main players, and I'm going to say just a little bit about them because Anthony Servino at the bottom of the hour is going to come in and go hard on these players. So I'll talk a little bit right now about Zeke Elliott. So Zeke Elliott is with the New England Patriots. And look, all offseason, they were trying to add another running back. At first, they did sign James Robinson for two years, and they let him go. They brought in Daryl Henderson, Leonard Fournette, Zeke. Um, I think Dalvin Cook was in there, if I remember correctly. Maybe he was. There was I think that was maybe the fourth one. So they were looking. And, and sometimes it's Bill Belichick doing his due diligence. But to me, it looked like he was really wanting to add another running back. And like I said, we will talk about Ramondre Stevenson in relation to Elliott later in the show, so you won't want to miss that. But a couple of quick hit thoughts. Yes, Zeke Elliott certainly is nowhere close to the player he was, but he is an effective short yard runner. Um, I do believe he can be trusted to hang on to the football, and that's often a big deal with our friend Bill Belichick. And um, Zeke Elliott can take some of those grinder carries, and um, just he follows plays as they are blocked. And it is very good for a coach to have that stability uh, in terms of Stevens. And like I said, Anthony Servino will be talking about him a bit later. The one thing I'll point out and I'll point out again later is this goes under the radar. Now he only lost one fumble in each of the last few years, but he put the ball on the ground four times last year to the prior year. And Bill Belichick in his history, we've seen him at times bench running backs who have ball security issues. So and just something to keep in the subconscious. But again, we'll talk more about that a bit later. I'm not going to spoil it all before Anthony comes on. And then Delvin Cook, of course, goes to the New York Jets. And everybody rightfully so wonders, okay, we've been wondering all along. He was in their camp a while ago. It was clear the Jets wanted to add another back. Brees Hall, we were very unclear. We First, we had really good news. Then things got quiet. And so where do we go? And so that leads us into the next piece of news before we um, do a little bit deeper dive on Delvin Cook at the bottom of the hour. The Jets did reinstate Brees Hall from the active pup list on Tuesday. So he is set to practice in limited fashion. And we're almost a little less than a month before the start of the regular season. So, I mean, there's time here. And so that does give a positive note to the potential for Brees Hall being ready to start the season. But again, I'll go very surface on this because we'll get Anthony's coming in later. But Delvin Cook on the roster, I always said, with their smoke, there's fire. And if a team is going to add a higher profile, although declining back, that does tell me that they probably do not want to give Brees Hall a full role maybe that's partial season maybe that's longer but as a valuable player on their team they may be looking at the bigger picture here so again ADP part of us says oh well maybe we move him up because he's starting to show up to practice but then part of us says man what about workload concerns now Brees Hall if we knew he was 100% healthy even on a lesson workload we would still be really excited because he showed elite skills Yards after contact, breaking tackle or broken tackle rate. He was an elite superstar. And look, and this is a dumb point, right? But had he not got injured, where would he be going in drafts this year? I mean, would it be reasonable to say he'd be a top four fantasy pick? He may well be if he had not been injured. And so that is something that fantasy managers have to try to deal with. 
We've seen some players not come back very well from injury ACL wise. We've seen other you know, very rare, but we see some players come back close to full form. So anyway, that's just thing again, deeper dive on the jets backfield, bottom of the hour, stay tuned. Won't want to miss it. Got a question in here. I can probably take this quickly here. Keeper league, keeper Madre Stevenson and seven or Rashad white in round 12. So I just paint a little scenario about Stevenson. And I said, we'll deep dive that later, but honestly, Rashad white and this top of my head, I believe he had a seventh, like number seven, broken tackle rate. He's really lean in the legs. And to me, I don't think that he is going to be a player that's going to hold up to a workload. I could see the Bucks bringing in a player. There's already been talk from Jenna Lane of ESPN, the beat writer, that Chase Edmonds is going to be heavily involved on third downs. And that would take a lot of value away from Rashad White. Remember, Dave Canales coached against chase Edmonds when Edmonds was in Arizona and um, Canales was speaking very glowingly about what Edmonds brings to the table and you've heard me talk about this all preseason look chase Edmonds was very good for four years in Arizona he went to Miami he was not a system that he was lost because at the end of last season he got traded to Denver he did have a high ankle sprain but the last two games of the season you look at the same chase Edmonds that he did in Arizona and if that's the player they're getting that's a very good football player, and I do not see Rashad White as a guy that's going to keep him off the field all the time. So Stevenson, as of right now, would be my call. A seventh-round pick is very generous. So even if he does lose some of that work with Zeke Elliott in, his catch ability, we had 89 targets last year, definitely um, that should be still in play to a degree. So I think, to me, Stevenson is the play. And – um. And I'll take one more. I got to get back to the notes here. Uh, we have second overall pick in a redraft league. I do take Christian McCaffrey if I have the second pick and Justin Jefferson is off the board. Certainly, I don't have any qualms of taking Jamar Chase or his floor is super, super high. And I know Chase was hurt last year. So durability for McCaffrey. Yes, he played you know, every game last year. He did get dinged up in the playoffs. He's coming off of two prior seasons where he only played about 10 games. So that's still there. There's still risk. I do expect Kyle Shanahan, though, to manage McCaffrey's workload with the understanding of keeping him fresh. So I am going to take McCaffrey at number two in a redraft. But if I have, let's say if I have six or seven number two picks over the course of all the drafts I do, I would have some chase sprinkled in there as well. All right, back to notes. So, Indianapolis Colts news, Coach Shane Steichen, he named Anthony Richardson the starter for the regular season. So what does that mean? Well, I kind of said this all along. It Basically, they are going to have to install a heavy RPO-based offense. I also know they have five tight ends on their roster, and all are potentially worthwhile players. Now, they might not keep five. But what it still tells me is that they want to run sets with two tight ends, maybe three tight ends, but they want to bludgeon defenses and use the running of Anthony Richardson to create heavy boxes and then to give them favorable secondary counts where he could take the occasional deep shots into single coverage. And that could be a very winning proposition for them. Yes, we may think and know that Richards is limited as a passer. But if you see light secondaries and you have favorable matchups, he can win on those. He has a good deep arm for sure. So, the other, but back to the point, I said all along, you can't install this RPO-based offense all summer long and then say, Gardner Minshew, you're starting week one. It doesn't work like that in the NFL. You can't just say, okay, well, we're going to roll out a different offense this week. That, that doesn't happen. Now, if there was an emergency where Richard said they just thought, you know, you just need to watch for a week to see what's going on, then they may have taken the growing pains with that and either run a vanilla offense or just tried something crazy. But that's off the, that's off the table now because they were always trending in this direction. Anthony Richardson, look, he is a beast running the ball. It would be better if Jonathan Taylor shows up, and that's I'll move to Jonathan Taylor in a second here. But um if Taylor's there, it helps more. But regardless, to have that mobile quarterback with the size he has and the athletic ability he has, I really do believe 900 rushing yards is his floor. Now, I don't know what we're going to get out of him as a passer, but I do know if you're already talking 900 rushing yards, you are in the mix 
as at least a low-end QB1 in 12-team leagues. And then if the passing clicks a little bit, there would be more ceiling. I do have him at QB10 because of that rushing floor that I am expecting. And that floor is important. You know, we think about players like Kirk Cousins who have implosion games. Running quarterbacks don't often have those. You know, you put up that 50, 60 yards rushing, and all of a sudden you've already got a baseline. You're going to get something in the passing game. It's not going to be like a zero. You're going to get something there. So I do believe that mobile quarterback, you have to have him you know, in that range where he's considered a starter. Now, you'd be smart to get a second quarterback, you know, for if something goes south or if he gets hurt. It'd be smart. I would do that. If I'm drafting a quarterback outside the top nine, I would take a second. So let's continue with Colts news. Jonathan Taylor, he does remain on the active pup list. He's had an extended absence due to rehabbing his ankle. He reported to the facility on Monday. So it, it's convoluted right now. He's probably trying to avoid fines by being a hold in instead of a hold out. But he has no real leverage here. The Colts could play hardball with him and just basically let him rot. And then he would go back to them next year. Um, I, it's, it could be ugly. There are a lot of different scenarios. If I'm a gambling man, I do believe that Jonathan Taylor will be on the field in week one. And I believe with that mobile quarterback and the RPO system, he will be devastating in that system. I do believe the injury is being overblown a bit. I do believe he will be the same Jonathan Taylor we've seen at points in the past. But this version of the offense where he has the mobile quarterback, you can't gang up the same way on the running game because the RPO looks screwed up. And then what happens is if they sell out too many players, the second level is left vacated. And if Jonathan Taylor gets beyond that, oh, my goodness, the number of big plays that could be there could be astronomical. Hey, tonight, which is Tuesday if you're watching this live – I will be live streaming the NFFC Beat Jim Coventry 3 draft, 8 p.m. Eastern, right where you're watching it right now. So come back. If you're watching it now, watch it tonight. And I will break down every participant's draft in real time, including my own. When I give my pick, I'll give you the strategy behind it. This will be a very fun, high-stakes draft. I do think we will have a lot we can learn. We'll learn about roster builds. I'll make as many points as I can, but it should be a very, very fun time. Please join me for that. Now, Kyle Shannon in 49ers News announces that Brock Purdy met elbow UCL. He will not require scheduled off days anymore as the team begins to gear up for the regular season. So, we're looking right now at Brock Purdy is probably a full go for week one. Now, we remember last year, it was multiple touchdowns in every regular season game he played. 49ers won every one of those games. It was a beautiful thing. I do want to point out, as it got near the latter games that Purdy was playing, he was making more mistakes. League was getting film on him. There was a little more commotion, a little more disguise. He was throwing the balls behind some receivers. He got away with a couple potential interceptions. So it was like, yes, he was still winning games, but the warts were starting to get exposed. Now, all quarterbacks have them. Maybe not Patrick Mahomes, right? But um, that said, with Brock Purdy, and I think fantasy managers get this, he is not getting drafted aggressively. So I think people kind of understand it may have been a perfect storm. I think he'll still be okay, but I think the run game is going to be really, really heavy in San Francisco. Now, Purdy's going to make his choice, but if he has problems, if he does throw the ball behind players like he did last year, I know Sam Darnold's been terrible, but in that Kyle Shanahan system where Brock Purdy succeeded, where other quarterbacks for shorter periods of time have succeeded, where Jimmy Garoppolo was bordering, you know, strong quarterback status, is it possible that Sam Darnold comes in and could do the same thing Purdy did? Again, he's Sam Darnold. I get it. But there would never be a better situation to be walking into. So we'll see. Purdy's going to have to pick up where he left off. But it will be interesting to see how that all shakes out. Now some Baltimore Ravens news. So, look, J.K. Dobbins, still the same story. He was activated from the pup list. He did participate in Monday's practice. But we still don't know what the deal with him. It appears. It appears. Better than it did, right? It looks like I right now he's getting ready for week one. It seems that way. But if he pulls the rug out on them 
I could see that happening too. He has no leverage. It, it, he has less leverage than Jonathan Taylor. Dobbins missed a full season with an ACL, played in recovery mode last year, missed time, I believe six weeks, four weeks, six weeks. So he has like negative leverage. But right now, I would say, if you're drafting today, I would say prepare as if J.K. Dobbins is a go for week one. If you are risk averse, stay away. I get it. And he's being drafted usually just outside the top 20 running backs. If his ADP stays there and if Dobbins could put together a healthy season, he could easily outperform that ADP. He was at, I believe, 6.0 and 5.7 yards per carry, but he was down the stretch. It was crazy. He was at the top of my head, okay? I think he was over seven yards per carry, J.K. Dobbins, in his last four games. They were all against divisional opponents last year. And remember, we were hearing that he wasn't, he was still recovering from that ACL. So J.K. Dobbins, and now with an offense that's going to have a passing gear to it, maybe more spread sets, more room to run. Yeah, I think J.K. Dobbins, if you believe he's going to stay in camp and, and report as he should, he's already reported, I mean, but he stays around in the regular season. I do believe. He is one of those players. He is coming at a value, and I believe you could take advantage of that, uh, that value. Now, I've got a comment out here about Kyle Phillips. Kyle Phillips is a good slot receiver. He played a game last year. I believe he was six for 66 in the game. Then he suffered a bit of an injury, and then he came back, and he wasn't quite right. The thing is, how much are they going to pass? Chiggy Akakwo is a tight end, is more of a move tight end, and he really showed to be a special player. They have DeAndre Hopkins. They have Traylon Burks. And all said, it is a Derrick Henry-centric offense and a defensive-minded team. So as much as I like Kyle Phillips, by the way, if you're looking him up on your list, it's 1L, all right? If you're typing him in and you're doing a draft list, you type in Phillips like LL, you're not going to say no player exists. You got to type in 1L there, all right? But that said, it would have to be a 20-round-plus league before considering him because I don't know how many snaps he can get. Because I think ultimately they're not going to run a lot of three receiver sets. I think a Conquo is going to be a the third wheel in the office. And again, are they going to have many games where they hit 30, um, you know, pass attempts? Probably not many. Now, if the defense falls off the rail, if Henry gets old fast, then all of a sudden they may have to adjust on the go, but then that minimizes Ryan Tannehill. But um, yeah, that said, I do like Phillips as for his talent and skill set. And if he was on a team that threw more, I think I'd like a lot more. I did like a start to the season last year. And I was, I was, I had shares of him last year, deep leagues, but um, again, that injury after week one, it kind of did him in. Hey, if you've been enjoying this show, please consider if you're on Rotowire YouTube, hitting that like and subscribe button. It would help me out greatly. And again, Please give me a follow on Twitter or the X at Jim Coventry NFL. And I'm posting player threads. I didn't get one yesterday. Still, again, I'm recovering from the Fantasy Football Expo weekend. But I'll get those player profile threads up there. You're welcome, Rob. But um, definitely give me a follow, and I appreciate it greatly. All right, a little more news here before I talk some Kings classic draft that we can learn from that. So I'll, I'll do these quickly. Uh, Kendra Miller, Saints third-round pick. We know earlier in the preseason, he had that knee injury. He missed some camp time. Now he has a minor knee sprain. He's going to miss a week or two. So basically has not been a good off season for the rookie. Jamal Williams, you know, right now with Kamara being suspended for those three games, Williams, 99% will be the lead guy. I always say this. He might not be a great player, but he does everything that coaches expect. He's in the right place at the right time. They, he wasn't used as a receiver in Detroit, but he can catch the ball a bit. So I think that Kendra Miller, if he gets back healthy, I think these injuries are going to give him a bit of a minimized role. But if he can impress in that, maybe he can get more of a role for later. But then once Kamara comes back, I think it's going to be really hard for the rookie Kendra Miller to crack the lineup. And then, look, Zach Ertz, I love Zach Ertz. He was a great player for a long, long time. He is expected to come off the pup list this week after tearing an ACL last year. But here's the thing. I, I rostered Ertz in a lot of leagues. That's when he really helped me early in the year. And I was hopeful with DeAndre Hopkins suspended, he would get target share, and he did. There was a point between weeks three and six where Ertz was averaging nine, I believe, 9.5 targets. And he wasn't doing much with it, but he was like banking the PPR points. He only went over 50 yards twice. His yards after the catch. 50% that like five, like a handful of them. So that was problematic. So now he's 32 coming off an ACL. 
I don't think we're going to see the best of Zach Ertz anymore. I think Trey McBride cuts into his workload a bit. The team's got to move forward. They're in rebuild mode. I can't see Ertz being a big part of that. I can't see him being 100% from a guy that would lost a lot already. So again, I am not drafting Zach Ertz as much as I've loved him for years. And I invested in him last year. I'm not going to do that this year. And then actually I'm going to move to my Kings class. Let's see. I had a quick question here. Um, Actually, I'll talk about the RB, RB approach but, um, when I do it in my draft here. All right. Um, so I want to tell you about Rotowire having a deal right now before I move forward. If you want free access to Rotowire with no credit card needed for the entire month of August, which is about 15 plus days right now, you go to rotowire.com slash expo. It's our fantasy football expo deal. You just need an email address, no credit card, and um, you'll get behind the paywall at the end of the month. The paywall will just go back up and you'll be back to where you were. But definitely check out all the great things that we have to offer at Rotowire. So, as you know, and we talked yesterday, I drafted in the Kings Classic Jim Brown Division auction. And I drafted in the, the, the Snake League as well. And now the thing is, it's 14 teams. And I know a lot of you don't draft in 14 teams, but these were some of the heavy hitters in the industry. And I, I would start saying names, but if I do, I'm going to leave one or two out, and I'm not going to do that. But uh, I have an, a free article on Rotowire about the Kings Classic if you want to see a little bit more about that. But, again, one of those standard, industry standard leads. But even though it's 14 teams, here's what we learned. We solidified the quarterback approach in fantasy leagues for this year. It's been going all preseason. It's not going away. The top three quarterbacks are going to go very quickly. That's going to be your any order. Patrick Mahomes, Jalen Hurts, Josh Allen. Some people have one ahead of the other. They're all elite options. They are all going in reg typical leagues. They're either going, starting to go in the late second round or gone by the middle of the third. And that's the way it's going. And I don't think that's going away at all. It's the next tier of quarterbacks, any order, again, depending on you have them ranked. And I'll just say the mobile guys first, Justin Fields, Lamar Jackson, Justin Herbert, Joe Burrow. That gets us to of seven quarterbacks. And then um, some people move Trevor Lawrence into that tier. Many others like myself have Trevor Lawrence and then Deshaun Watson together in a tier outside to make it a group of nine. Now, what's the big deal with quarterbacks this year? Here's the thing. Last year, there was such a standard set for quarterback scoring that the floor for these top-end quarterbacks has become very solid, and the ceiling is obviously exponential. The other quarterbacks in the packs before last year, the next, the, the late group of quarterbacks, those were always viable in dress. A lot of people had weight on quarterback, weight on quarterback, and it worked. It was okay. The standard in this league has become such a passing phenomenon Passing isn't the ball, not passing isn't moving forward. But um, yes, so getting those top quarterbacks does give you an advantage. And in the Kings Classic, it it was like one tier. It was like quarterbacks one through seven. It wasn't even a one through three. Now, they the top three were drafted first, yes. But in a span of 15 picks, eight quarterbacks were taken. That started in the third round. And it was 14 team league. It was so other leagues that might start a half around sooner, but it was fast and furious. And again, Trevor Lawrence was considered in that group. And it was like 15 picks, eight of them gone. So in your home leagues this year, I, I do think that, you know, if, if it's a sharp league at all, and people are kind of following the trends. If you want those quarterbacks, you've got to go get them. And what I'm telling people is make your draft. Once you see, if you want one of the top tiers, you got to jump and get them. You can't waste time. I don't mind the second tier. So I wait till one or two of that second tier are gone, and then I'm looking to take one as quickly as I can. My fail safe is, and I'm getting him in the Kings Classic and others, Deshaun Watson. If I miss out on the group because of where I'm at in the draft and that big run of quarterbacks took me out of it, I do think Deshaun Watson is going to be back. The speed of the game comes back to him. We saw before all the craziness and chaos and – terrible stuff he did he was right there as a top tier quarterback and I think that comes back in the Kings class let's talk about running backs so again in your home leagues receivers are going heavier than they used to we used to have eight nine running backs going the first round you might have three you might have three now 
B. John Robinson's going later in the first round. Eckler and McCaffrey. Those three are probably going. Sometimes Nick Chubb sneaks in, especially if I'm drafting or Howard Bender's drafting. So we could get up to four running backs, but it's really not more than that. So it's definitely different. Now, a lot of people will come out of the first two rounds with either two receivers or running back and a receiver. There are some people who will take two running backs. I have drafts where I've done that. I have drafts where I've had two receivers. I've had drafts where I've had one and one. Really, I'm reading the board. I tell everybody this. When you're setting up for your drafts, you set up your four columns, quarterbacks, running backs, receivers, tight ends. And then as the players are getting drafted, eliminate them from your board. You need to see in real time how the attrition at each position is going. And when you do that, you have a feel for what's on the board and how you can react and draft responsibly and accordingly. Now, Jonathan Taylor is the polarizing player. I took Nick Chubb at pick nine. I picked again at pick 20, again, 14 team league. At that point, the Kings Classic is a, is a very, very important league to me. If I don't win that league, it's useless. I failed. I was a complete failure. Making the playoffs, don't care. Second place, don't care. When Jonathan Taylor was on the board 20 picks in, I said, okay, he may not play this year, but it's a half around value if he shows up and he's going to play. So I am doing that because of the importance of winning this league. Now, everybody wants to win their league. I get that. But there's a lot of paths to winning. But in an important league, you get a half around on value. Remember Saquon Barkley a few weeks ago. Barkley had, you know, it looked like he was going to have dis discord with his contract. And then for a week, he fell back to the end of the second round. So people had access to him for a week that were drafting in the one, two, and three picks that would never have access to him again. It's a huge advantage. So, but running backs, there are, depending who you like, you can get good running backs, good running back volume, good running back volume in the fourth round and on. You can get Cam Akers. I know people hate James Conner, but I paint the case from over and over. Um, there's Damian Pierce. There are a number of backs that you could build with receivers earlier and be fine. Um, now, if you're hunting receiver early, you're going to have to make an aggressive move at some point. And players I've gone after – and targeted DJ Moore, I believe, is a little bit underpriced. He has those three 1150 yard seasons before last year. I do believe the Bears are going to air it out a bit with Justin Fields. They have to see if they have a franchise quarterback. I do believe he is way better than any of the quarterback play that DJ Moore had in Carolina. I think DJ Moore's floor is 1,250 yards. I do believe he's a superstar player. He can win at every level of the field. He's a running back with the ball in his hands. And I do believe his target share is going to be very high. And I would expect him to get at least 125 targets. When there's a world we can get 145. But this is the year that you can get a value in him, and I think he'll come through. And you've heard me talk about Mike Williams. Mike Williams – had, I believe, five games in which he had nine or more targets and at least 86 yards in every one of those games. When he gets the ball, he produces. Now, people say injuries, injuries. Last year, he missed games. Six years ago as a rookie, he missed six games. But in the four years in between, it's a bunch of 15 and 16 games played. I believe with Kellen Moore, now the offensive coordinator, this offense is going to no longer run through a slot receiver and a running back. It's going to be a downfield passing attack where they press downfield to open up things underneath. I believe Mike Williams will be more heavily targeted than he's been. I believe he will be a value in your drafts. And then later in the drafts, you know, there's a PPR guys you can get. You know, we have players like I have been off Juju smith for years, but in New England, RPO based system. Zone openings, they're going to get the ball out quickly. Juju Smith-Schuster fits that system. He could get you 75 catches. And then outside the top 110 picks, 100 picks, that is wide receiver floor value in PPR leagues. Traylon Burks is going outside the top 100 picks. I get it. People love DeAndre Hopkins. They should. It's a Hall of Fame type player, right? But if you know the history of Ryan Tannehill, it's play action and slants. Play action and slants. That's a sweet spot. Well, outside of the perimeter, DeAndre Hopkins is a very good possession receiver at this point in his career. He's a catch and fall guy. His, um, I believe his 14th percentile broken tackle. He's never been a yak guy, and he certainly wasn't last year. He had incredible volume, but that volume in Tennessee, that's not going to be crazy volume. But if Traylon Burks, remember, Burks is hurt early in the season. 
He was going on a tear. Then he had a concussion in week nine, I believe. And then he missed the game, slow coming back. And then he was right back on track. He looks like a first-round NFL draft pick, yards after the catch. It may be a, uh, be a ton of catches, but he can be a value outside the top 100 picks. Um, and that said, with tight end this year, look, I if I'm not – if you take Kelsey or Andrews, that's great. You know they're going to produce for you. You have a beautiful floor. You got a great ceiling with Kelsey. Kelsey's a first-round pick. I just don't – personally, my roster builds aren't what I like, but I, I don't – I totally take those guys early, totally. It's totally worth it. I just don't like my roster build, so I shy away from it. If Dallas Goddard falls outside of 70 picks, I think that's a good value for him. And otherwise than that, I'm going to just take some darts. I'm going to punt, tight end, try to build up my – running backs, receivers, and I want one of those top eight quarterbacks, and I'm willing to punt. And players I'm willing to punt for, and these are deep, um, deeper picks. Uh, first of all, in New Orleans, we have Juwan Johnson. He had 500-plus and seven touchdowns last year. Remember, he was a converted wide receiver from college. And when it took three years to acclimate, that's normal because he's playing tight end in the NFL. And so when we look at that, all right, that was a pretty exciting start. Well, they're going to run two tight end sets, and we know they brought in Foster Moreau, but here's the thing. Foster Moreau's probably going to block. Juwan Johnson's a legit receiver, and Derek Carr doesn't like pressure, so the middle of the field is going to be his friend. And then late in the draft, I really expect Jake Ferguson to be the receiving tight end in Dallas, and you're getting him free in drafts. With Jake Ferguson, the way I see it, it's that he is going to be – he had 79th percentile of Liarto to catch now, very limited, small, small, small sample size. But Dalton Schultz was a catch and fall guy. And Dak Prescott reads his defenses extremely well. So overall, yeah, I think that that's the play to go super late in drafts. So everybody, I'm very excited to bring in my friend Anthony Servino, Rotowire, gambling.com, the FF faceoff. We'll talk about that later, but you need to be watching Anthony's show. You can follow him on socials at the real NFL guru. Anthony, what's going on today? What's going on, Jim? How are you? A lot to talk about that drop last night. Oh my goodness. And I, I saved it. I, I only told people at the beginning, I, I, I told them a little bit of cursory information. I go, Anthony Servino's breaking his stuff down. I'm going to let you take the ball and run here. So first of all, obviously after being in their camp a little more than a week ago, going away without a contract. Well, yesterday it got done. Dalvin Cook signed on the dotted line. He's on the team. Brees Hall is apparently going to do some light practicing. Tell us what's going on here, Anthony Servino. You know, when Dalvin left New York without a deal, I, I thought that was done. I thought maybe the Jets lowballed Dalvin Cook, tried selling him on a Super Bowl. Instead, he went to chase the money. That could have happened, and maybe Dalvin's market wasn't that good. So he decides, okay, I'm going to get a deal up to eight and a half million for one year, and I can still chase that Super Bowl. Uh, the surprising thing is that it looks like Brees Hall's good to go. So that kind of goes with my narrative. This is less about Brees Hall's injury and more about the Jets believe they are a better football team with Dalvin Cook and Brees Hall in that backfield. The issue is, from a fantasy football perspective, how do we rank these players? How do we draft these players? And this is the tough one. So Dalvin Cook, look, look we saw it last year. He is a declining runner. He still breaks tackles, but he's not getting the yards after contact he wants. And that's where the decline is hitting him. But he was more efficient as a receiver as he had been. His yeah. yards after the catch was quite good. And so now we have this quagmire. How are, they're paying Cook good money. Yeah. Running backs don't get this type of money. And I was saying all along, where there's smoke, there's fire. Are they worried about usage for Brees Hall? about setback what's the play here and so i'm a little confused of how they're going to use cook because if they want to use him as a runner that's not really a suit and this is a way worse offensive line than he had in minnesota but if they use him as a receiver hall is really good there too so how do you how do you break this out um, I, I think both of these players are going to be quite active in this offense. Uh, the odd man out could be michael carter wouldn't surprise me if they just move off of him altogether, maybe get a draft pick or some kind of compensation for him uh, because they have Bonaconda and Zonovan Knight. So Carter might be the odd man out here. But I think in fantasy, 
Brees Hall, we're going to see his ADP drop maybe a round or two. And the same thing with Dalvin Cook. We're going to see it rise maybe a round or two. I'm going to, I'm a Brees Hall guy. From what we've seen early last year before the injury, he was electric. He looked like the next big running back in the NFL. So I'll buy the dip on Brees Hall. Uh, and I'll also buy into Dalvin Cook. I, I think how I'll handle this here. Uh, is I'll let the board come to me where uh, if Brees Hall's a little bit too expensive, or I feel like I have to reach for him. I'll fade him and go get Dalvin Cook later. So when we're looking, this is a lateral question, and it's just for reference point. Had Brees Hall not gotten hurt last year, finished out the season the way he started, where would he be drafted in redraft leagues this year? Would he be picked I, three or four overall? Would he be three or four overall? Yes. I, I, I could see a that. world where Brees Hall, if he played a full season the way he played in the first few games pre-injury, we're talking about Brees Hall as a first-round pick in fantasy football drafts. I agree with that. And so that's the lens we're looking at. And the thing is, we have the uncertainty. Some players do come back fine from the ACL. It's not all the time, but a lot of players to have a little bit of a set a step back that first year back. And so we don't know what we're getting. So there is a lot of gambling, but you said with the ADP drop, most likely are we, are you thinking we're looking late third, early fourth at this point? Now with cook getting signed. I mean, depending on what league you're in, like uh, FFPC, I, I was seeing him going uh, late third, early fourth as it is. So there's a chance you can get Brees late fourth round. And it all depends on the format and who you're drafting with and what they believe in. And because, it, you know, if you're a Brees Hall guy, you might think or might be kidding yourself. Well, this Dalvin Cook thing, it doesn't really impact him and vice versa. So it all depends on what your mindset is. But, you know, Brees Hall, we can't deny that uh, in – the games that he played, he was a number what a number one running back last year in yards per touch at six point nine, and number three in true yards per carry. He was elusive, number three in yards created per touch. So he's yeah. the real deal. Oh, he was sick. He was sick. Good. So here's like the next question. So if somebody gets a discount on Brees Hall, it's a narrative. Again, we're not medical doctors. Every player is different. But we saw it with J.K. Dobbins last year. Mm. He missed time. But by the end of the season, the last four games, he was seven yards a carry against four divisional opponents. It, it was pretty intense how good he was. Now, he's not going to run for seven yards per carry this year. But back to Brees Hall. Is it possible that if you're drafting Brees Hall, it's of the hope that he is much stronger in the second half than the first? What are your thoughts on that? I can see a world where they try to ease him back a little bit, but the difference between Dobbins, I, I feel like with Dobbins, there was a lot of back and forth, almost like this off season. There was still a lot of back and forth with Dobbins. Whereas with Brees, it was always, he's been trending in the right direction. I never saw that negative rumor or report on, on, on Brees Hall. Uh, whereas last year was uh, back and forth on J.K. Dobbins. So I, I feel like it's more positive this offseason, which makes this whole Dalvin Cook signing very questionable and, and makes me think this is more about the Jets chasing that Super Bowl than the injury. So as Anthony points out, and I'm going to rephrase it, basically this is a stock market. And right now with the Cook signing, we are seeing potential decline in ADP to our favor on Brees Hall. So this is what we call that buying opportunity. And so you, you, if you could get a half a round value on a player that has superstar ability, if you are, especially if you're in one of these contest leagues where you're playing against thousands mm -hmm. of others, it's a chance to get ahead of the field to take that risk and take that move. If you're just in a 12 team home league and you may not want to swing for the fence, you may prefer to take the layup, and just, you know, the rest of your roster is strong. But you have to understand your risk tolerance and your aggressiveness factor, and you need to build that in. That's what your decision ultimately comes out to. Any final words on that, Anthony? Uh I'm gonna I want to veer off into two other formats. Number one in best ball. Don't be afraid to corner the backfield of the New York Jets. You know, I, I think when my initial appearance on this show a few months ago, um, I, I was in, a, we were breaking down one of my drafts and I took uh, a couple of the Eagles running backs. This Jets backfield is a situation where I wouldn't mind taking both Brees Hall and Dalvin Cook. And if you're in a dynasty format, this is a one year deal for Dalvin Cook by the dip on Brees Hall because he will more or less be the guy again by himself next year. Now, Anthony, when we're talking New York Jets, the interior line is okay. I don't have any issue with the interior line. But 
Dwayne Brown is getting close to 40. I mean, yeah. maybe 38, but man, he's probably, his knees are probably 45, but, but he hasn't been extremely healthy. And we have Makai Becton on the other side. We really haven't seen him on the field too much. He's lost some weight. There's a positive signs, but um, are you worried about the offensive line in the running game? I, I have a little bit of a worry here, but less about Dwayne Brown because Dwayne Brown's a really good football player and he's he been is. a really good football player. And injuries aside, we've seen uh, Whitworth from the Rams be really effective into his 40s. And the same thing with Jason Peters. Uh, so as long as Dwayne Brown can stay healthy, I'm a little bit less worried about him and actually more worried about Mekhi Becton because his career has been erratic so far. Oh, to say the least. So we didn't really make a final point on Delvin Cook. Where are you comfortable drafting him? And will you have a solid level of exposure to him in drafts? I already have a solid level because I was buying him at a discount, assuming he was going to go into a favorable situation. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have a, a decent amount of Dalvin Cook exposure. And I'll, I'll take him as high as a sixth round. Anything higher than that. Uh, sharing a backfield with Brees Hall. I, I, I don't know if I can stomach any higher with Dalvin Cook, despite, like we said, declining player. But this is a guy who 1,400 total yards uh, a few years in a row. And, and he also had 10 touchdowns last year, which was a bounce back from six in 2021. You know, Anthony, I, the Minnesota Vikings, they had some on and off offensive line injuries, but their run blocking was very, very solid last year. But I also noticed as I was studying Dalvin Cook, his numbers declined in the second half of the season. Mm. And as you're aging, the grind of a season, it plays into that factor. So I do believe, and like I said, we do like Dwayne Brown as a player, but I do believe in terms of run blocking, there's a significant downgrade from what Cook had in Minnesota. I do believe the decline continues. And you roll another calendar on the clock. Um, what Are there any thoughts on that? On the, the, the on the regression of the offensive line? And the fact that Cook in the second half, he was far less efficient in the second half of the season than he was in the first. If anything, it makes me want to buy more into Brees Hall. And I'm already a Brees Hall guy. Perfect. Yeah, that's kind of how I was thinking you would go with it. I want to make sure the audience understood that before we went on. Um, you have time for a little bit of New England Patriots talk, right? Yes? Absolutely. All right, good. So, look, Zeke Elliott shows up, and he is now on the New England Patriots. Um, over the whole offseason. First, they signed James Robinson to a two-year deal, and then they cut him. And then they brought in, I want to say, Fournette. They brought in Daryl Henderson. I think they brought in Dalvin at some point, and certainly Elliott. And now they sign Elliott. So I don't think it was Belichick doing his due diligence, because we know in the past he would just bring in people for his file to see what they had. But it always seemed, because they signed Robinson, they wanted somebody on the roster. What does the addition of Zeke Elliott mean to Ramondre? I guess just to say Ramondre Stevenson. Ezekiel Elliott, uh, to me, has some juice left. Now, is he that explosive guy out of Ohio State? No, he hasn't really been that in the NFL since his rookie year. But what Zeke does best, he's that short yardage plotter, the short yardage grinder, the goal line guy. He reminds me of, of maybe he's a little bit of a cheaper version of Damian Harris in this offense. And what makes Zeke maybe a little bit more of a thorn in the side of Ramondre Stevenson fantasy managers is the fact that he's been more durable than Damian Harris. So, yeah, he's a step down talent wise because of the age and he's slowing down. But I, I do think we get more games out of Zeke, which means more opportunities to vulture Ramondre Stevenson. So I'm a little bit worried about Ram. We also have to note, I, I don't think people give enough credit to the fact that Ezekiel Elliott's very much a capable pass catcher out of the backfield. Mm -hmm. Like this isn't, uh, he's not an empty in that category. Zeke, uh, you know, he's had a season with 77 receptions, 54, 52, 47. So if, if people think this is just uh, going to be Ram as a receiver, no, Zeke's going to catch the ball out of the backfield in New England. And, and if anything, he's a little bit of a slower Ramondre Stevenson. They remind me of the same player. So when we look at Stevenson last year, and I know he had a bit of an ankle ding at the end of the season, but he played. If you're on the field in the NFL, I, you know what? I consider you healthy. No, nope, yeah. it is what it is. He has 210 carries and 89 targets. So obviously he's being drafted as the RB9 this year because based on the PPR, his scoring was amazing, really on the back of those catches because he only had two big rushing games. They were both over 150, yeah. but there weren't a lot of big rushing games. So – 
89 targets. Zeke's in. There was talk in OTAs. This may just be that May talk that I like to ignore, but they were saying they could see Pierre Strong in the James White role. What is the probability of Stevenson seeing anywhere near the 89 targets he had last year? Uh, I, I think a, a little bit lower. Uh, New England, they believe, I'd like to think they are going to compete, right? Like it's a hard division, hard conference, but you bring in Bill O'Brien, the offense is going to be more competent. I, I, I think they believe they're a team that could compete for a wild card. And what makes them a good wild card team in December, that's getting Ramondre Stevenson healthy in December. So I, I can see Zeke having a larger role, almost like the, the Dalvin Cook analogy or, or narrative with Brees Hall, where we might see more Zeke early and, and, and they, so they get a better run out of Ramondre Stevenson late. Now, Anthony, last year, before the talk switched where Ramondre Stevenson had overtaken Harris, I was already on Stevenson. I'm like, Stevenson, at that point, is going to be more effective a player. And I was on him. This year, at RB9, I was completely off him because of the smoke and fire, the fact they were bringing backs in. And they're going to an RPO-based offense this year. Last year was the train wreck of Joe Judge Mm. and Matt Patricia. And this offense is going to be designed RPO-based, and I just don't think it's going to be dump the ball off to save your life. I think it's going to be a lot different this year. I think the passing volume that a running backs goes way down. So I am out on Ramadre Stevenson unless there is a severe market correction, and I really don't see that coming. Would you draft Ramadre Stevenson in his current ADP? Or if not, where would you draft him? I don't have a lot of remind, and I like him as a player. I, I just don't mm-hmm. love the situation. I don't love the the ADP this year, so I don't have a lot of exposure to him right now. Uh, he would have to fall to to like the back of the third round for me to begin considering drafting Ramondre Stevenson. Where this is a situation where listen, I, I don't know how high. Zeke's ADP is going to is going to go and, and look what he did last year RB 22 fantasy points per game 12 touchdowns uh I I would rather buy into Zeke as, as long as his ADP doesn't get out of control and I don't see that happening one point I brought up at the top of the show before I, I didn't do any detail but I, I'm going to bring this up to you Bill Belichick it's been a long time but when he has a fumbler he doesn't like fumblers Ramondre Stevenson only lost two fumbles in two years. However, he fumbled twice his work or two years ago. He fumbled four times last year. Do you think there's a world that Belichick sees him as a fumbler, Ramondre Stevenson? And is that a possibility why he brought Zeke Elliott in? And if that's the case, could we see the Stephen Ridley thing of what, 15 years ago or whatever happened where Stephen Ridley was a great player, but he put the ball on the carpet and Bill, Bill, Bill Belichick would just yank him out and banish him. I don't put anything past uh, Bill Belichick at this point. And and Zeke, contrary to Ramondre Stevenson, has been careful with the football for all the wear and tear he has on his body. Uh, so this is uh, almost like going back to what we did with the Patriots backfield years ago. Buy the cheaper player and the cheaper yes. player, Zeke, and fade the expensive one. Whereas last year, you wanted Ramondre Stevenson. He was the most expensive back, but you still bought him. Not in the second round where he's going right now. Yeah, so I think Anthony and I agree. Zeke, Zeke Elliott could have a fair role. And if the narrative is right about the fumbling or if Stevenson continues that, Elliott could have a bigger role than we even ex- imagined in yeah. the first place. So the cheap piece, he could become some, it's going to be a lottery ticket. Anthony, are you, you're getting him probably at this point. Is there a world he's going earlier than the 10th, 11th round? No, I I, no. I don't see for him no. falling in, into the even the tenth round, or at least you no. shouldn't, I, I, especially with so. the way the fantasy community talks about Ezekiel Elliott, like he should have been done yeah. years ago. There's no way I I, I see him going uh, anywhere close to the tenth round. That would be that would be mind blowing. Yeah, I think as well. So I think where you're getting going to get him, I think it's a screaming value. And the worst case scenario is okay, he doesn't have a role, I drop him. But if yeah. you can hang on to him even for a while. It could be an injury, and he could step into – remember, volume is king in fantasy football. Yep. Can't forget – running back. Anthony, tell us what you have going on so everybody can keep up with you and follow your work. 
you know, all the content we push out over here at Rotowire and Gambling Group, also at FFaceoff.com. My show is running, uh, you know, four to five times a week right now. And once we get into the regular season, we'll be uh, at the FF Faceoff podcast five times a week, uh, all things NFL fantasy football. Yeah, again, I had the pleasure of working with Anthony on the FF Faceoff a couple of years ago during the offseason. It was a wonderful time, a fantastic show. If you're not following Anthony's show, you need to do that. It's very informative. Anthony, as you see right here, he knows a ton about football. He's somebody you can learn from, so make sure you're following along. him. Anthony, appreciate your time and hanging with me. Everybody out there, thanks for hanging with us. Tomorrow, Tuesday, Tuesday tomorrow's Wednesday. It'll be 11 a.m. back here, Rotowire YouTube. And remember, if you're watching this today, Tuesday, Tuesday evening, 8 p.m. Eastern on this channel. We'll be breaking down the beat Jim Coventry NFFC draft. Everybody, have a great day, and we'll talk soon.